Hello everyone, this is Eric from Etiquette back for another Sunday night live stream. For anyone new here, my name is Eric and this is a live stream we have every Sunday for teachers, especially English teachers. Um, put your name and where you're from in the comments. If you've got a question or you want to talk about teaching, just go in the comments and say hello. Now today we've got a very special stream because you're not going to be looking at my simple face anymore. I've got a guest coming on in a couple of minutes, but first uh, we'll wait for everyone to join and then I will int introduce our guest. And the first person we have is Ayaz. Ayaz, hi, waiting for this. Hi, Ayaz, good to see you. And then one of the, the channel favorites, of course, is BM. Hi, Eric. Uh, are you over cloud nine today or depressed? Are you glad to see us or fed up with us? And my answer, BM, is I am so happy to see all of you every single Sunday. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's definitely a highlight of my week. And, you know, once I finish, I'm, after each live stream, I'm kind of exhausted but happy. And then the, the, the following days, I'm always excited and thinking about, you know, what are we going to talk about in the next live stream? Um, is the guest your compatriot or does she speak English better than me? Most people speak English better than me. Uh, you've heard me before. I make so many mistakes and I think she's a fantastic speaker. She speaks really well. And that's why uh, one of the reasons why I want to have her on. Uh, Bonnie Esther. Good morning from Massachusetts, USA. Looking forward to hearing from Jamie. Hi, fellow teachers. Hi, Bonnie Esther. I hope you're doing well. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, you might notice, you might have noticed that um, this channel is almost at 100,000 subscribers. Um, I think we're going to hit it maybe in a day or two and maybe right before maybe 20 people before we hit 100,000. I will do another live stream and do it in real time to see if we can reach it, unless it's like in the morning and I'm sleeping. And when I do that, I'm going to play some of Bonnie Esther's impressions of me. She made some videos where she does impressions of me. It's so funny. Uh, BM, do you think that 2023 you will reach 1 million? No, no. Um, uh, I think it will take another three, maybe to five years. And by the way, only after three year put in my my um my best effort um by the way uh, guys i'll give it another two minutes and then i will uh introduce jamie she's waiting muhammad ciao sue thank you for all the kisses matloop marites zubin hi there great energy thank you what's wrong with your finger by the way uh, guys last week i told you i went to get surgery um it was very painful they put a wire through but um you know uh, hopefully it will heal and uh, what do you guys think of my Hawaiian shirt? Uh, I got it. Um, I got it in Thailand, and I am really chuffed with it. I really like it, but I know a lot of people won't. Bonnie S says, "I like the haircut. Yeah, I like the sporty look." Uh, Bun uh, Bunwa, hi, hello. Uh, Ilmi Yati, hi. MD Abdul. Hi, Abdul. Good to see you back. Mohammed weekend is coming to an end. Yes, but this is a highlight to it. Hello from South Africa in Turkey. Jane, so interesting. We talked about it before. Okay, well, everyone, uh, today's live stream is different. We've got a guest on, so I will go through the comments. I won't read all of them. This will be mo mostly a conversation between me and Jamie, but if you have any questions about teaching, especially for Jamie, please ask it in the comments. I will go through and um, we will answer some of it. And BM says, <laughs> I bought it in Thailand. Okay, without further ado, let's welcome today's guest, Jamie. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Jamie, how are you today? And where where are you right now? Yeah, well, there's some clues in my background. So I'm originally from the US, but I am near Brisbane, Australia right now. So Australia. it's actually the evening for me. Excellent. Uh, actually, I'll remove myself for one second from the stream so you can see um, what her background looks like and you can try and spot some some <laughs> Aussie uh, paraphernalia. Clues. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let me remove myself. Mm, let's see. Oh, got to move out of the way. So we've got this book here. We've got the flag. There's a few things from Australia. And this is a photo from one of the beaches in Australia as well. Did you did you take that photo? 
I did. It's in Fraser Island, which is the largest sand island in the world. Interesting. See, you <laughs> learn something new yet every day. Okay, Jamie, uh, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Jamie. I have been teaching abroad and online since 2010. I started teaching kids and then did a little bit of teaching adults and then later on a lot of teaching adults and 2020 was kind of the time that I started teaching online. So now I'm teaching online 100%, but I also coach people on how to teach abroad and online as well. Okay, uh, so uh, how long did you teach in the States again? In the States, I did my student teaching and I was a substitute teacher. So it wasn't very long because I actually got a scholarship to go to Egypt after I graduated and finished my teaching in the US. So I was out of there pretty fast. Wow. Okay. You didn't even get, get a chance to really, <laughs> really get stuck in. But um, uh, uh, what was your major? What did you study? You studied education and to teach English? I actually studied Spanish and education. So I thought I wanted to be a Spanish teacher. I did all of that kind of stuff. I did almost got a minor in history as well. I was thinking about teaching history, but then I started going abroad and obviously teaching English in Spanish speaking countries rather than Spanish. It just made more sense. Spanish. Well, let me tell you something very interesting about Spanish. Um, I don't I don't mean to brag, but my Spanish is really good. And um, but some of the, my viewers, their Spanish isn't that good, but they're always looking to learn new Spanish words. So so for my viewers, um, not for me, um, <laughs> can you share what, what is a what is a good Spanish word that um, my viewers, not me, can learn? OK, um, hmm, that's a good question. I need like a theme or something. I don't know. Um, I guess. When I lived in Spain, I started in the south of Spain and I did live in Madrid as well. So that area is kind of known for flamenco and kind of a little bit of a different culture. And so um, I like the word alma, which means soul. And I think that that's a beautiful word, but also kind of they use it in a lot of flamenco music. And I did some flamenco dancing lessons there as well. So. I just like that word. Alma. What is the word for for soul? Alma. Oh, Alma. Okay, interesting. Uh, by the way, uh, I was just kidding about the Spanish. Uh, uh, Bonnie Esther also speaks Spanish. One of our viewers, ah, and many amazing. of our viewers are from South America. So, uh, why don't you just say quickly say hello in Spanish to our Spanish um, speaking viewers? Hola a todos, cómo están? Hoy soy. Uh, Bueno, estoy hablando con ustedes desde Australia y vamos a hablar un poco de cómo vivir en el extranjero y enseñar inglés. Okay, perfect. I understood everything <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so Jamie, uh, you've been all around. You, you started in the States, you went to Egypt. How long were you in Egypt for? Oh, good question. So I was supposed to be there for a year, but I was there during the Egyptian revolution. So I actually got evacuated and I finished my scholarship year in Spain. So in total, I was there, I think around six or seven months. And then I had to kind of finish my scholarship in Spain once I had figured out what I wanted to do. Do you regret that or do you think it was a blessing in disguise? Um, I would have loved to have stayed in Egypt for longer. I absolutely loved it. My Arabic was improving a lot. And then, I don't know, it was strange. I could kind of sense that something was going to happen. And I think everyone kind of had that feeling in the air. And uh, yeah, just from one day, it got a little bit crazy. And the next day, I had to leave my house in the middle of the night and stay with some friends. And got on a flight. We had no internet in the country. So I boarded my flight with a ticket number on a piece of paper. So that was definitely wow. interesting. Wow. Very interesting experience. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's uh, you can make a movie out of that at some point. It sounds like, you know, yeah. um, 
it's a dramatic time, you know, suddenly having to leave a country. Very stressful. Um, let's move a little bit uh, to teaching because I've had a few questions here now about teaching methods. Now, currently you teach online, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, what is a what is a class with you like? If, if if you had to explain how you run your classes with a new English learner, um, do you teach one on one or do you have like a few students? Um, well, I teach groups of kids and I also teach freelance, usually adult one on ones. So I have done some group lessons kind of in person at my house as well. But as far as teaching online, I do more specifically test prep. So that is, yeah, very one on one and individualized to kind of what the learner wants to accomplish and i like to do a lot of goal setting with them excellent because okay this is this is actually very interesting because uh during this week um i was uh, a friend of mine asked me uh, oh eric how do you prepare for toefl or you, you mm -hmm. know and uh, i haven't had much experience preparing students for test so during the week i made it my mission to look up tips and techniques to um how on how to prepare students for these tests, uh, IELTS or TOEIC or the, the Cambridge tests or um, TOEFL. So I think this is really good. Uh, uh, do you have some tips or how would you how would you prepare your students for tests? Because we had another question around here where it's um, also asking uh, BM asks what methods do you use to teach students to write a short essay? We'll get to that now. But how do you prepare your students for these tests usually? Yeah, so first of all, I'm going to do some sort of uh, little test to see kind of what their weaknesses and what their strengths are. Because for tests, you often have to get a specific amount of points in each different section. So you're going to get different points for speaking, writing, listening, reading. So if you're a strong speaker, that's a good thing, but maybe you're lower in writing you're going to need to do more work with the student with writing. So it kind of depends on what areas they need to work on. I'd say in my experience, typically, it almost depends on nationality. So some nationalities just naturally seem to be a bit more confident speaking, could be because of their schooling system or just personality wise, whereas other um, nationalities struggle a bit more with writing skills, can even come down to handwriting. For example, students that their native language is Arabic are going to be slower at writing and these are timed exams. So I really look at different factors and kind of look at what we need to focus on because my goal is to help them pass these exams so that they can go on to live or study in foreign countries. Excellent. Well, that's, that's such a good answer because, um, yeah, I think for teachers, it's so important to um, find out where your students are and where they want to go, you know, um, because you've got to figure out what level they are, uh, what their strengths and their weaknesses are. Um, and, and this is something that I find a lot. So when they prepare for the test, um, they have to focus on reading, listening, um, speaking and writing. Um, and you, you mentioned that some students struggle perhaps with writing but in your experience, what is the, the, the skill that most students struggle with? Uh, I would say probably writing because the writing for exams are going to be very specific. So you could be an amazing writer, but you're actually getting points based on if it's in a specific format, if you're including specific grammar and vocabulary, and if you're using, you know, the right kind of language, the register, is it formal, is it informal? And so oftentimes they may be able to write sentences that are grammatically correct, but if they're not using the right vocab and grammar at the level that they need to be showing, then they aren't going to get that highest score. And so I think that it's not only teaching those skills, like the skill of writing, but also you have to kind of teach for the test, which can yeah. be challenging for the student. 
Yeah, there's a massive difference between teaching students to communicate and teaching students for tests. Now, um, with my job and what I've been doing uh, most of my teaching career is helping students to communicate better. And that's fine. You know, you want to build their confidence. You want to get them in these conversations. But preparing students specifically for tests, that's a, that's a whole different thing. I've seen some of these videos where um, you get native speakers with non-native speakers, but the non-native speakers are perhaps, you know, some Koreans or that, that are really good at taking tests. And they just blow the, the, the native speakers out of the water when it comes to writing these tests because yeah. there are certain <laughs> skills that you have to learn. Um, yeah, uh, when I was looking at teaching writing, I think structure is important, getting them to, to write. And also stick, they, they said stick to your... Uh, usually you've got to write you've got to write down your opinion right so they give yes. you like two options um, or you've got to write down your opinion stick to it um, and then in your body you're going to give reasons uh, to to explain and then also they said it's very important at the end of each paragraph to have a nice ending and ending statement for each paragraph which is interesting but I think there's so much to learn now we've got amazing questions here from everyone <laughs> uh from Fulia from Subin we're going to get to yours too and uh, also to some of you but let's go to Fulia first uh, she asks um was it hard to switch from Spanish teaching to English teaching at first that's a great question I think that when you learn how to teach one language you can kind of teach any language because the methodology is going to be very, very similar. So a lot of the studies that I had done, it translated perfectly into my first jobs teaching English. Um, I did work at a bilingual school while, while I was still student teaching. So I found that to be very interesting as well because I was basically doing lessons in both English and Spanish. So I got kind of double practice um, so that was probably the first time that I was really teaching both. But yeah, I think it's such a good skill, uh, you know, um, being able to speak different languages and also applying that to your teaching. And many reasons for that. And actually, uh, that leads us to the second question. And I think this kind of moves to this two ways. Rubin says a question. Uh, there's a lot of prejudice when it comes to teaching English as a non-native English speaker. Now, um, uh, we've we've had this question before where teachers, especially non-native English teachers, say, listen, there's there's a lot of bias or um, it feels like prejudice. Um, employers prefer native speakers, um, uh, you know, compared to non-native speakers. But on your channel, you help all teachers and a lot of your the, 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 the teachers that watch your channel are non-native. So what would you say to this this question from? Uh, yeah. So it really depends, like in my context, as far as teaching abroad, it will depend on the country. So in Australia, there's about 50% of my colleagues are non-native speakers. So I think Australia is one of the best places to teach as a non-native speaker, because I worked with teachers from all over the world and they were really valued because they do... Um, explain the grammar a lot better than native speakers just because they have a different way of obviously they learned all the grammar differently um, but if you go to other countries you'll see only non-native speakers for certain visas so I do think there is a lot of prejudice but the way to get around that is to make sure you are very very qualified so often for non-native speakers that means getting an actual teaching license not just a TEFL it means getting a CELTA, a DELTA, a CERT TESOL instead of a basic 120 hour TEFL. And it means getting some practice in your country first, which I think is completely unfair, obviously, because there are a lot of teachers that are non-native that are way better teachers than native speakers. Just because I can speak it as my native language doesn't mean I'm a good teacher. So that's, yeah, you just kind of have to look at the different countries. And online, you'll find the same thing. Certain companies only want to hire certain passports. So what you want to do is freelance teach because when you freelance teach, there's no one telling you, you know, what you can do, what qualifications you need. And often you can target students that speak your native language because you're gonna be able to help them with specific errors and pronunciation and things like that that you have struggled with personally. So that's kind of my advice is 
If you want to teach abroad, make sure you have all the qualifications that you can get. If you want to teach online, freelance teach. Perfect. I, I think that's that's fantastic advice. I, I agree. I've got a friend from um, from Eastern Europe, and she just gained um, so many qualifications, and she got experience, and she and now she works for Cambridge because she's just that good. And there, there's no denying it. But um, yeah, if you're going online, try and try and freelance. Um, and then, uh, by the way, uh, how was your weekend, Jamie? Just to just to push some. Uh, a different <laughs> question in. What did you do this past weekend? Oh, well, we celebrated Christmas in July, even though it's August, it got postponed, but uh, I dressed up a little bit in some Christmas gear. So that was fun and just had a little get together in the park. And I, not very glamorous, but I did some video editing for my channel. So I've been doing some videos about teaching abroad and online and just getting those ready to release on my channel soon. So not too crazy of a weekend over here. <laughs> well, but what is Christmas in July? And by the way, guys, on YouTube, um, I put uh, Jamie's channel in the description below. And the channel's name is for everyone on LinkedIn and, Fa uh, and Facebook. It's uh, 365 ESL Teacher. Yeah, ESL Teacher 365, yeah. Okay. Yes, I'll teach her three sixty five. Uh, check it. It's it's on Facebook and it's on um, on YouTube. Uh, what is what is Christmas in July? Christmas in August? What is that? You got to walk me through that. Well, I was actually explaining this. I have a um, an Italian language partner right now because um, I am preparing to take an Italian language test. So we meet once a week, and I was telling her about this, and she loves Christmas. So she was like, "What is this? I need to know." I'm pretty sure it was just created because of being able to offer more sales and things like that. But the premise, I guess, it started in the Southern Hemisphere because we kind of miss out on the cold weather to, you know, sell, have our Christmas celebrations, but in July when it's actually cold here. Um, so, yeah, I guess you'll see a lot of sales and deals and things like that, but in Australia and in the U.S., people like to dress up and have parties and things. So it's another reason to celebrate. Why not? That's fun. Uh, I actually I do miss Christmas. Uh, uh, wait, Christmas in during summer because I'm from South Africa and we also yeah. have Christmas <laughs> during summer. You know, so it's it's always w weird watching these most of the the Christmas movies. It's always snowing, and we're like, well, it's a bit warm for snow right now. So that's a good idea. <laughs> Okay, um, well, we've got another question here, and I think you're qualified to answer this uh, from Martha. Uh, Hi, mm -hmm. teachers. Maybe Jamie can give some advice on teaching on online platforms, the ones she prefers, fees you need to pay attention to, etc. Now, uh, you were talking about freelancing before. I know you you know many of these platforms, uh, but when you get to freelancing, can you also talk about um, how you got into freelancing and how you can find learners like that? Absolutely. So we will start the normal trajectory and then we'll talk about how I started and I actually did it backwards. So if you're new to online teaching, there's basically three options. So first there's online ESL companies, then there's online teaching marketplaces, and then there's freelance teaching. So for online companies, typically right now, you're going to be earning about 10 to $15 per hour. You could be teaching maybe two to four students, um, could be a larger group, but it's typically smaller classes. And a lot of these companies, unfortunately, do hire native speakers. So it's kind of passport based. Now for teaching marketplaces, it's kind of like an in-between of companies and freelance teaching. So these are places where you're going to be creating your own lessons, but you get to decide how much you charge per student. So you're not earning per hour, it's per student, how long your classes are, what you're teaching, and you're able to teach English or you're able to teach other subjects as well. So I actually teach on two platforms, well, three platforms, um, OutSchool, AllSchool, and Awaketh. And I teach the same lessons on all three platforms. So in this way, you can basically lesson plan once and then use those same lessons on all the different platforms. So they'll be based in different places. They might have learners from different time zones. 
And then once you feel comfortable with this, I always recommend moving towards freelance teaching because that's where you're going to have the most freedom, flexibility, and the highest potential to earn. And if you're looking to find students, uh, the easiest way is to use social media. I actually did a training on this recently on my channel. So if you are interested in like a lot of detail on how to do this and best practices for different platforms, I would say check that out. But in general, you're going to want to optimize your social media bios, have it really clear who you teach, what you offer them, and kind of what transformation. So for me, I taught um, test prep for, it was like romance language speakers. I kind of started out romance language speakers preparing for Cambridge English exams. So I was helping them pass those exams. So my Instagram now, which has now become more for teachers, originally was for students. So that used to be my bio, but um, yeah, you want to optimize it and then give them a good call to action. So how should they contact you? Email you, go to your website, should they send you a DM? You just want to make it really simple that they look at your bio and say, oh, that's me. I'm this person and I want to transformation and I'm going to contact you by email or whatever. So you just wanna make it really easy for students to contact you. And then from there, I recommend having some sort of onboarding process so that you are seeing what level your students are at, what their goals are, what they I'm want gonna to pause you. I'm gonna you. pause you there because this is quite a lot and it's so interesting. Um, yeah, so you you mentioned all the different plat uh, all the different platforms you use, and you can teach. It's not only English; you can teach many things. But I think there, there's a larger audience, more students that that want to learn English. And then you yeah. started talking about freelancing. And if you want to freelance, what it means is you teach online and you find your own students. Or what what you've mentioned is that they find you. So you um, you improve your uh, or you uh, you improve your social media put in a good bio a good photo uh, you add maybe um, messages or things that you do you explain what learners will learn so first you explain who you are and what they will learn and you give a call to action um, message me here or send me a dm or this is my whatsapp something like that i think linktree is very useful to have many links if you want to but i think just focus on one. Um, so you do mainly Instagram, uh, also Facebook, wherever there's a an online platform, you're putting content on there to find students. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I always recommend going to the social media that your students are going to use. So you need to think about who is my target student? Where are they hanging out? And if you're not sure, then you want to kind of ask and do some market research and see you well, are they on TikTok or are they on LinkedIn? It's going to depend on what kind of student you're targeting. Right. And uh, I think on WhatsApp, you might also um, try and join some groups. That might be, in, uh, I mean, on Facebook, you can join groups. Um, have you ever run any ads to try and find students? No, I have not. You've, uh, you, you haven't run any ads for students? now okay um yeah and then so after that you were talking about okay so now you find your students and we've actually we've got a question here where it's um let me see let me see let me see uh oh here we go linkedin user hello eric and jamie can you give me some tips on how to teach english to a year one student with zero english now most of your students you try and improve their um, you try and get them ready for tests. But have you ever taught very young learners before? Yeah, so I taught kids for the first seven years of my career exclusively. Um, yeah, so for zero learners, my philosophy is always to only use English. So I taught in Spain and I, of course, knew Spanish, but I didn't say a single word of Spanish with some of my kids that I had for two years. So it is possible to teach them with images, miming, videos, activities. Your whiteboard is your best friend. And usually you can also use the kids. There's gonna be a few kids that know what's going on, something clicks, so you can have them be your translator. If there's something that they really don't understand, 
have the kid explain in the native language. That way you're never speaking the native language and they know that they can only practice English with you. Mm, so they have to. Okay, good, good stuff. Um, and then you, um, um, the other thing you were talking about when I rudely interrupted you was, <laughs> um, you know, when you found, okay, so let's say you find your students and now you want to create a curriculum or you want to help them achieve their goals. How do you go about that? Yeah, so first seeing where they're at, then you also need to look at how many lessons do you do they want with you? What are their goals? So imagine a student comes to you and says, I want to speak fluently in two months. Okay, well, you need to think if that is truly your goal, how many hours per week are they going to need with you? What kind of work are they going to be doing outside of class? So you need to talk with them and be a bit realistic to come to an understanding where it's going to work for both of you. But obviously you as a teacher, you know if something is possible or not. If someone comes to you and says, I want to go from A1 to C1 in one year, you know, it's it's not going to be very easy. So you need to be a bit realistic with them. But if they have a specific goal, then kind of laying that out, what you recommend, how many lessons with you, and what that's going to look like. Right. Um, I, I think it's it's so important having goals, something to reach for, especially for language learners where, um, you know, they might get discouraged if uh, because it's difficult to to know how how you've improved on your own. You know, you can you can be studying, you can be working, and then it's difficult to gauge, oh, am I improving my speaking? Am I improving? Being my writing. Um, so having these tangible goals that are realistic and that they, they know, how, um, you know, perhaps it's their test score, maybe it's uh, the amount of vocabulary they study, maybe it's like um, learning the how having conversations in these different situations. Goals are extremely important. Now, uh, we've got Zubin. Zubin actually says, he says, I've got a CELTA. I've got the, the MA in English Lit, um, but my passport. I'm from Iran. Uh, it's a hard time to be from Iran. Uh, best place I've worked at was EF in Cueto. Very international. But as you said, freelancing is the way to go. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, Zubin. So what we were saying before about, you know, you, you've got to be qualified. It, it sounds like you're qualified enough. Great. So now it's, now it's just about, you know, a bit of luck and also perseverance and getting into the right place. But, uh, you know, I'm I'm from South Africa and uh, our passport is also quite limiting, not as much as uh, Iran, but still it's 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 difficult to get in places. Um, but yeah, I, I think perseverance and also a little bit of luck because you're doing everything on your end that you have to. Okay, Jamie, do you have any questions? Is there anything you want to talk about? Because I feel like um, I've, been, I've been asking all the questions and been running the thing. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to look through here, see what we got. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, uh, yeah, to maybe like write down the names of the platforms and things like that. Yeah, I can do like a big comment maybe um, after the live stream. That would be helpful. And I have some videos on my channel as well that kind of go through all the different popular platforms. Uh, I like Definitely this one. When teaching it. online, do you want your students' cameras on? If so, what do you do when you notice they're off for a bit of the lesson? Yes. So this, I would say young learners will have their camera on. Adults usually will have their camera on. It's like the middle school to high school when the cameras start, you know, going off. Um, just make it really clear. What is your policy? Um, I currently teach really young learners on out school ages four to seven. They all have their cameras on. They're loving it. Um, and when I'm working with one on one, they have their cameras on as well. So I don't personally really uh, experience this. But in groups that I'm in, a lot of middle school and high school teachers are always saying, oh, my gosh, what can we do? So it's up to you, but I would say sometimes if they want their camera off, take advantage of the chat box or, you know, have them work on a Google Doc together where they can see everyone is at is adding information or whatever you want to do. But yeah, it's just kind of the way things are these days. I think that students now, since they had so much schooling on Zoom because of the pandemic and everything, they're kind of over it. 
And it can be an extra challenge of teaching online is engaging them enough to keep those cameras on. That's so nice. Um, yeah, great advice. I think especially when you teach individuals, you know, you want to see them, you want to see how they speak and you want to build like a connection with them. And with young kids, they want to be seen. They want you to see them <laughs> and they want to have fun. Uh, but perhaps with the, with the older students, especially if it's large groups, um, it's it's perhaps easier if um, if it the, the, the video is off. Um, now, you talked about using Google Docs while teaching online. Is it, uh, do you put some, some, uh, do you put, uh, what do you put on Google Docs that you usually work on with the students? Yeah, so for example, if you're doing a writing task, um, imagine that you had your students and say it's for a large class, you could even put them into uh, groups in a breakout room, something like that, and have them do a collaborative writing piece, or it could just be a worksheet on a Google Doc where they have to fill it in and then maybe you go over it together. So it's a good way to kind of let them collaborate. Obviously, a lot of online platforms also have the whiteboard function, so you mm -hmm. can use that in a similar way. Um, but just, yeah, adding a little bit of technology. And then when they have the Google Doc, they can also use that after for homework or they can look back on it for notes as well. I think that's that's excellent. It's almost like proof of effort. You know, if, if, you, put <laughs> students, um, if you put students into groups to say, okay, this is the activity I want you to do. Um, maybe they're in the group and there's silence. No one's working. They're just waiting and then... Uh, once they come back, they just say, oh, we, we did this or we didn't do it or we didn't have enough time. <laughs> so some complaints. So it's it's very useful if there's there's something that they have to show. So I teach my students uh, very soon when when they start start with me how to use whiteboard and I encourage them to open it up and they've got to work on it and save it. Because when they report back to class, they're going to have to show their work. And I think that's that's so good with Google Docs, too, that you've got this uh, this proof of work. Right. And um, so this comes to another question by Omar. He says, uh, can you provide us with 21st century techniques in teaching, which are completely different from traditional ones? Now, I've got an idea of what most teachers are going to say to this, but... Um, it's tradition on my channel. When I get a difficult <laughs> question, I just put it onto the the guest, and that <laughs> gives me more time. That gives me more time to think, and I might steal your answer. So, uh, okay. Jamie, this is your question. I'm ready. Twenty first century, uh, of course, using cell phones. So, obviously, depending on the age, if you have like a four year old student, you're not going to be using cell phones. But I would say using those in a positive way in your classroom can be very helpful, very interesting. Activities that I've done is, for example, doing like WhatsApp um, activities with different emojis, things like that. Um, I make my students record themselves when they're doing their speaking tests. And then the worst part, which they really hate, is then listening to it. And they say, oh, my gosh, I'm doing um and so and saying this. It's like, yep, uh-huh, you are. And now here's the evidence. Um, making videos. You could have them do different advertisements to practice speaking skills. They have to write it out before as well. So there's just so many things you can do with phones. But, of course, in the classroom, you need to be careful that they're not just sitting there on Instagram and scrolling. Well, nowadays, TikTok and scrolling through. But I'm pretty strict in my classroom. So they know that when the phones are out, we're doing an activity with them. And when the activity is over, goodbye phones. That's so nice. Yeah, we, um, you know, the, the, the reason for education is to prepare students for uh, for the future, right? And uh, I, I think we can't be stuck in just teaching old ways. I mean, there there are. I think teaching in general, the 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 um the, the the basics will always be there. The basis of teaching, you know, make things interesting, get your students involved. That will always be there. But now we've got to start applying new things. What are students? Um, uh, what gets their attention these days? You know, it's the, their phones or uh, what activities are they interested in? You know, and um. Uh, you know, you bring up phones and social media. And I was just thinking, you know, then when you role play, you could role play something instead of having like an like an old school role play of 
buying a ticket at the airport. Maybe you can have a role play of someone is a is a is a social me media um, is on Facebook and you've got a problem with your Facebook. Maybe somebody stole your identity and now you've got <laughs> to send them a message and uh, and talk about that. Uh, and we've got Kev the Rev. He says qualification is for job, but teaching is. Uh, is about personality not certificates 100 yeah, kev definitely um, yeah i think the the the, the thing about personality uh, or about qualifications is it, it it's just it um gets you in you know so it, it's just proof of you studying and improving yourself but i mean you can have all the qualifications in the world and still not be a good teacher and you can have zero qualifications and be a great teacher so but i i think it is important to try and get some of those documents, you know, uh, some of those qualifications. Kev, what do you think about the wine shirt? You are the <laughs> one, I, I think you're the one that uh, told me to get one. And uh, I'm so happy I did. Okay, um, let's see some more. Um, and Paul is here from Hardball English. He says, Eric, <laughs> new haircut must indicate that he has a new girlfriend. Yeah, I think, you know, get, getting a, a haircut means a lot of things, but I like this the 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 short ha um, hairstyle. Um, Okay, Jamie, uh, what do you want to talk about? Hmm, let's see. Yeah, we've got, I'm interested if people are more interested in teaching online or abroad, because we've talked a lot about teaching online. online. But, yeah, but now abroad. I don't know. Are there questions about teaching abroad? Okay, well, well, let's talk about it. You said that a lot of your uh, the people that you work with in Australia um, are non-native teachers, so they're from different countries. Um, how did they get the jobs? Do do you do you know? Yeah, so for that, like the actual qualifications for the job is typically just a TEFL certificate and a bachelor's degree, and often you will have to prove your English level through an exam. Um, to get the visa, but the visa is the challenge. So there's different kinds of work visas and student visas. I came on a work holiday visa originally. Um, so that is available to certain countries. And yeah, it just really kind of depends on your country and what visas are available. Yeah, I think the main thing is just uh, getting the right visa to get into another country. Hopefully the, the world opens up and and easier to to move around if you've got the right qualifications and the the um you know you, you've got the, you're going to try and find the right job uh obviously there are jobs around the world it's just about getting that visa and then also you know getting the job um we've got some questions bm just asked um how do you teach listening tasks mm -hmm. might be something different yeah that's a good one um, yeah, I guess it kind of depends on the level that you're focusing on, but you can do different kind of listening, almost like a reading activity. So you might have them first look at the title, if there's a title of the listening and start to brainstorm what they think the listening is going to be about. Then listen through once just for the main idea, tell them not to write anything, just to listen for the main idea, the gist. And then on the second listening, they're going to go through and maybe they have some questions they need to listen for or certain words that they're listening for. So in that way, you're kind of doing very similar to almost skimming and scanning like you would in reading. And then I like to have my students um, look at the transcript as well. So then they really get to see, did I understand this listening or did I completely misunderstand it? And then that can always launch you into another activity because maybe you'll focus on a specific grammar point, vocabulary, maybe there's a speaking task or writing task after it. So you can do a whole lesson just from one listening. Well, very nice. I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, mixing the different skills, you know, even though you're doing a listening task, you're going to use a script. Um, you know, they're also going to practice some speaking. I think it's it's very important to try and use multiple skills at the same time. Um, yeah, when it comes to 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 um, listening, like you said, it's uh, you know they they can use a script, and um, I like you can do something like a dictogloss where the teacher maybe um, tells a story to the students, and they've got to try and 
listen and remember as much as possible. Maybe they can make some notes quickly and then they've got to retell it to a partner. And, or, um, you know, you, you can do similar activities to that. Where And in that case, they're going to practice listening and speaking. You know, so a lot of ways that you can actually incorporate listening and then mix it with some of the other ones. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Paul says here, Jamie, although you're a native speaker, you're clear, clearly <laughs> a North American. So um, have you encountered <coughs> in Oz because of this? Um, I would say my students always uh, arrive to my class and there's a sigh of relief because they realize they can understand me because the Aussie accent is quite challenging. Even for me, there's times I'm like, what? what? So yeah. um, my students enjoy it. Uh, personally, when I did my CELTA course, my one of the tutors liked to correct my accent and she told me I was pronouncing things incorrectly and that I should say it the Australian way, which was Did you do your CELTA in Australia? I did, yes. I refused to do that. I said, I'm a native speaker. This is how I pronounce words. So I'm not going your, to change your, it. The, the words you used were probably make me. <laughs> yeah, it was. You it like, was change said, your accent. This is wrong. No. <laughs> I said, shown instead of Sean. <laughs> Sean me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. How was that experience? Because. Um, you know, in the future, I still want to go and do my Celta and do my Delta. I haven't done mine yet, um, but I'm excited to try and um, to go and do it at some point. How, how was that experience getting your Celta? So I did the part-time course, and I recommend for anyone who gets stressed out easily, definitely do the part-time course instead of the full-time. I worked at the school that I did my Celta at, so later on I saw a lot of the trainees who were doing the full-time course and they were always just Dressed running out. around like chickens mm -hmm. and it was not good. So I actually was able to teach at a different school while doing the Celta and I survived. Um, it was a great course. Even though I had a teaching license, I feel like I still learned so, so much. And especially if you're interested in teaching adults, it is a very good qualification to have. And if you're interested in teaching in Europe or the Middle East, a lot of those countries prefer CELTA or CERT TESOL. Interesting. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard about it, you know, especially the people that do full time. It's nonstop preparing for classes, teaching, preparing, teaching. Yeah. Um, how, how long did it take you to complete your CELTA? So it was 10 weeks. So we had evening sessions where we would do teaching practice and we would take turns teaching groups of students. And fun fact, my husband was in one of the groups of students. I wasn't allowed to teach him, but yeah. this was back when we had first arrived here and he was still working on his English. That was pretty fun. And then we would also offer feedback on other people's lessons. And then we had input sessions on the weekends, pretty much all day, Saturday and Sunday. And that's when we would learn different teaching techniques and methodologies. But I, I also recommend the part-time course because you have more time to reflect on what you're learning and think about it. The full-time course is very go, go, go. And there's not mm. a lot of time to process. I see. That's that's really important. Um, wait, I had a really okay <laughs> says here. Eric is trying hard, but to be professional, you need some pineapples and coconuts and maybe a rainbow. Uh, it's so funny. A rainbow in Korean is mujigi, mujige. It's, it's, uh, I, and you see it everywhere, especially this material. Uh, there was another question that I wanted to see. Okay, uh, Martha says. Uh, what equipment is a must for online teaching? Apart from the basics like web camera and headphones, what do you do if you teach while being at a place with a bad internet connection? Okay, some tips there, Jamie. Yeah, so I would say for equipment, it's going to be the most comfortable to get a set of headphones that are comfortable, especially if you plan on teaching for quite a few hours. Um, gaming headsets, so even if it has a little microphone, but just those kinds of headphones are quite comfortable. Um, and also you'll want to have, if you have large classes, I would say invest in a second monitor. So 
So I teach some classes of up to 14 kids. So I have a separate monitor where I can see all of them and then I can run everything else. Like if I need to share my slides or anything like that on my other laptop screen. So I definitely say that's um, something to look at. And if you're traveling, there are portable monitors that you can get as well. So yeah, good quality microphone, very comfortable headset. I use a whiteboard and flashcards with my kids. Um, obviously, if you have older kids that can write, you're going to be using online tools like the online whiteboards and things like that. I'm trying to think of like any splurge items. People always uh, talk about the background. So you want uh, to have something that's not too distracting. You obviously don't want to show like your dirty kitchen in the background and things like that. But if you want to travel and teach, you can get a portable background. And then as far as lighting, I use a box light, but you can get very cheap portable ring lights. Just want to make sure that your students can see your face. Very important. Um, I also, um, so one of the things I think if you've got a bad internet connection or there's, there's a possibility of getting interrupted, I think it's important to set our students up for success. So if they know exactly what you're going to teach in that class, um, you know, what grammar it's going to be, what vocabulary. If you can prepare them by sending them, well, the list of vocabulary that you would, would have taught during class and, and the grammar that you, you're you going to focus on or the, the homework, then if there is an interruption or something does happen, they, they still know, okay, well, this is what I was supposed to do. Maybe uh, I, can, I can prepare some of it on my own. So I think it's very important, even if it's online or in real class, it's important for the students to know what it is. And we're going into the final eight minutes. We are <laughs> almost done, Jamie. It went so quickly, yeah? It did. It really did. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you about your channel. So you said you've been uh, making some videos. You've been editing. Um, what are you going to do on your channel? And uh, what can we see from you in the future? Yeah, so I will have a video coming out soon on Cambly, which is a really great um, online ESL company for people without much teaching experience or even without a degree. And so that's, it's kind of like a more conversation based um, platform. You can teach at any hour of the day. Students are all around the world. So I've been testing it out and I kind of go through the application process. And then I also tested out the premier TEFL, TEFL course recently. So just kind of going through that and giving a review to see if it's a right fit for some of my viewers. So I have lots of videos coming up on teaching abroad and teaching online, and I love suggestions. So whenever people say, hey, make a video on this, I usually do it. And I also like to interview teachers living in other countries. And so I have some videos up on my channel about teaching in Spain, Colombia, Mexico, Korea and looking to add some more countries hopefully soon. Excellent. Yeah, no, uh, you're doing a great job. I've watched some of your videos, um, lots of good information. Um, I think you really go into detail about, you know, teaching in different countries and especially with you having this experience of moving around, you know, for, for myself, um, I taught in South Africa and then the first country I moved to was Korea and I'm still here. So I haven't had yeah. like, a, a lot of experience, two countries. And uh, I think it's so nice having someone, different people and, and giving information about that is so important. Let's see, guys, final couple of, um, uh, final couple of questions. BM has a question. He says, do you practice any sport, Jamie? What I sport do. do you practice? Um, well, I don't practice here anymore because it's ice hockey, but I'm from Wisconsin in the U.S. where it's pretty much winter, like six months out of the year. So I like winter sports, but I also am a pole dance instructor and a ballet teacher. So I dance and yeah, these days that's probably mostly what I do. And I also have a paddle board. So I like to do that as well. Wow. Uh, it, it, you know, um, I think especially uh, I've got a lot of friends here in Korea, pole dancing is getting very popular. Those girls are so strong. 
wow, it, it takes a tremendous amount of, of strength to be able to do some of those moves. And paddle boarding too, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things <laughs> where it looks so fun and easy, but it's actually, it's quite a workout getting on there. <laughs> BM says, make a boxing match. I would lose so badly, BM. <laughs> um, yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, we are, we're almost finished. It's the fi final couple of minutes. Um, Amir says, do you divide your lessons such as pre-learning while and eventually evaluate? So um, if you have a class, do you kind of, in your mind, do you break it up into sections? If oh, you, yeah, definitely. Think? So I always kind of start the lesson. I like to use like a little bit of mystery in my class and confuse my students. They know that that's just going to happen because I'm trying to see what do they know about the topic or what do they know about the grammar points and... I'm just trying to pull out what I can from them and then I'll launch into my lesson and it will make sense. But yeah, we do some sort of kind of check for their, you know, prior knowledge and see what are we working with before we launch into the main content. Very nice. Yeah. So you've got to know what the student know uh, about the, the topic before they start. And Paul says, yeah, mystery. Yes, I love it. Yeah. And, and then, <laughs> you know, you get into the activity and then, yeah, it's it's so valuable for students to, um, you know, to evaluate what they've learned and to review and to go over, you, you know, they feel more successful too at the end of a class if, if there's some kind of evaluation or review to to show and another question paul actually has is he says uh, i teach online myself and prefer one-to-one -one. do you prefer that or teaching an online class and why yeah uh i don't know because one-on-one -on -one is fantastic but a lot of times when you have group classes you get more interaction you can do a lot of different activities and then your students are talking to different people, listening to different people, which can be valuable. So I think sometimes with one-on-one -on -one lessons, you know, it does get a little old kind of mm. hearing the same thing again and it's again. It's exhausting so. too, you know, if you have one-on-one -on -one and it's like, you know, it's just you and the student. If you have a talkative student or, you know, you, you've got material that they find very interesting, it's it's a really fun class. But then on the other side, if you've got a student that, you know, isn't as open or the, you know, it, it can be difficult, like pulling uh, hen's teeth. Um, sorry, continue. I just interrupted. Think <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I think energy wise, you need a lot of energy for group classes and one on one can definitely be a lot more relaxed and chill. So kind of think of your personality and what you prefer as well. Uh, I, I think that's spot on. Um, I also, I think I prefer group classes because um, you can do, you can put them into pairs, you can have group activities and, and the poor students aren't just stuck with me and, my, and what yeah. I talk about, you know, so, <laughs> so they can have fun and I can just review with them. So I think that is really good. Um, Jamie, it's been an honor to meet you and listen to your own experiences from Aww. myself. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Paul says, lovely, excellent points. Thanks, Jamie and Eric. Uh, Martha, uh, Martha says, uh, you've been so kind and helpful. Thank you both for the support you offer. Well, um, Jamie, yeah, um, I want to say thank you so much for coming on to the show. I had a great time talking about it. Um, any final words, final things you, you want to mention? Um, this is your time to tell the people. <laughs> yeah, I think um, teaching online or teaching abroad, it really comes down to what you want to do and just making sure that it's your goal and you're doing what makes you happy because there are definitely many different ways to teach abroad and teach online. So don't settle for something that you don't enjoy because there's going to be an option where you're going to have an amazing time. So yeah, just, wow. I don't know, just focus on what you'd like to do and don't be afraid to try new things trying you know okay a new company or a new way of teaching or a new level is always going to be scary but you're going to learn so much and you're going to up your skills and keep moving keep moving forward that's definitely something i'm going to take from this talk is uh you know if you don't enjoy something move on so often you know uh, i feel we've we've learned from past generations of just stick through it, you know, just grit your teeth and push through. 
Uh, if you have a difficult job, just push through. If you're in an uh, in a situation that you don't enjoy, just push through. Things will get there eventually. But what you're saying is that it's a big world. There are many opportunities. Don't limit yourself. Find what you want. And now I'm really going to take that to heart. Uh, <laughs> everyone, thank you so much for joining. J uh, check out Jamie's channel. Also, I put a link to... Um, uh, what is it? Um, you've got ESL a form teacher. there. Oh, I have a survey. Yeah. So if There's you survey are... in there, guys. By the way, yeah. check out the survey too. <laughs> it's in the. It's in the. Uh, it's down below. Uh, everyone, have a great day, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Happy